if you're comfortable, that's actually a problem. Did you know that it's better to not wait for the next opportunity? And how can women truly thrive in tech? We're going to talk about these today with our guest, Patricia Sobera. On today's episode of Bites and Banter, we're joined by a leader in tech who has quite the journey. She's a inspiration to women all across the world, a DEI champion, an ISG Digital Titan Award winner, and the global VP for delivery for the only HDI certified MSP. Patricia, it's good to have you. Hey, Rocky. Well, thank you for having me here. Great privilege. But also, um, I'm feeling slightly under pressure here, considering some of the uh, <laughs> fantastic guests you've had on this uh, podcast before. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, I think as we started talking a little bit about the opportunity for you to share your story on Bites and Banter, and for me, you know, I'm excited for you to have the platform to talk a little bit about your journey because it is inspiring, you know, just your background and how you grew up. You know, I heard, I've heard you on other podcasts and interviews talking about just imagining a world that you, you, you couldn't envision, you know, because of how you grew up under the Iron Curtain, right, in Poland. And so let's start there. You know, let's start with how living in the a time when, you know, food, food was being rationed, right? You, you didn't really know what the world was like outside of what you knew under the Iron Curtain uh, and martial law. And, you know, walk, walk us through your perspective and your, your, just your experience and the values as a leader that you've gained and, and really ultimately you as an innovator, like what came out of, out of your experience growing up in those circumstances? Great question. Thank you for asking. Well, listen, growing up in Poland in, in the 80s, and I'm revealing my age here, which is never good for a female, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, that, that era behind the, the Iron Curtain, so to speak, of course, had its huge challenges and, and, and huge, I think, limitations more than challenges um, in terms of choices of, you know, going to a clothes shop or, or even a, a food store, right? The choices were extremely limited. And what comes with it, I think, is the opportunities. The opportunities were extremely limited. Um, I always refer to being able to learn foreign languages like English or French. Of course, my native language is, is Polish, but I wasn't able to learn foreign languages or Western foreign languages um, up until the age of 15, actually, because, of course, before it was just just Polish and Russian. Um, and I think for me, you know, I really quickly realized that to be in a chance of getting out, as horrible as it sounds, or, you know, having other opportunities to, to perhaps leave communist Poland was to really learn languages. So, of course, I, I fell into um, that kind of uh, mode of becoming a linguist and studying modern languages. Um, and then actually for a very short period of time, probably about um, six to six to nine months, became a French teacher. Um, and then I had an opportunity to join Compaq, Compaq Computer Manufacturing, which then, of course, became part of HP as part of the graduate scheme. Um, and, you know, like many others who probably tell about their stories around coming into tech, I literally fell into tech, literally fell into tech. And, and you know, the rest is history. I, I guess I fell, fell in love um, in tech as well. Um, and, and, and the overarching, you know, sort of technology, how technology sets, you know, the, the kind of pace of change and how it's ultimately the spine of everything that we do. Um, you know, I think if I compare growing up in Poland behind the Iron Curtain and, and, and kind of what happened in the last couple of years, you know, I mean, chat GPT wasn't a thing two years ago, right? Yet here we are using it daily with our kids as a shortcut for, for homework. Um, so, you know, day and night, right? Complete, complete opposite kind of, um, you know, environments and, and um, complete um, opposite experiences. But I think to your point, that's ultimately what made me always say yes to opportunities that made me, um, I guess, being that more inquisitive, curious, open to learning person. Because again, when your choices are limited, when, when your opportunities are limited, you literally tend to grab everything you can. And that's kind of is your, uh, you know, mode of, of operating, right? And, and I think, you know, if I didn't grow up in Poland in the 80s, would I be like this? Who knows? Um, but I think that had a great role in, in, in sort of shaping me as, as a person, ultimately as a leader and as a technologist. So it sounds like 
that experience really motivated you to say yes, right, to the opportunities. And um, I think something you mentioned in the past is really leaning into pivotal moments, you know, that that arrive when you least kind of expect those situations to arrive and stepping out of your comfort zone. Uh, with that, I'm sure comes some adversity, right? And in, in, in anybody's career journey, there's going to be lessons learned and failure along the way. What are some things that you've learned through adversity, right? Maybe under the Iron Curtain, or even as a woman growing up in tech, right? And transitioning into this quote unquote man's world, right? Historically that people perceive it as to really overcome and be where you're at today. What are some of those lessons you've learned through that experience of adversity? Ultimately, I am an, I'm an immigrant in the UK, right? A Polish immigrant in the UK. Um, and I think that's probably adversity number one often being told to go home or stop stealing British jobs or maybe join the more typical Eastern European sort of trades, which uh, people are kind of expected to perform here, which for females, quite frankly, it's retail, waitressing, and, and for men is plumbing and building, um, which is insane, right? Um, and I think just going back to that um, fluency, fluency in English, um, for me, that was a big challenge to start with. I knew that um, the best way to become fluent was to lower my super ambitious expectations to start with when I first arrived in the UK. So I did waitressing. I did, um, you know, lots of kind of odd jobs here and there. I actually completed my master's degree when I was um, in, in the UK um, in collaboration with University of Glasgow. And, and, you know, I was exhausted. I was working at cafes during the day. I was writing my dissertation at night. I was I was working in clubs and pubs. Um, and, and that wasn't easy. Hearing, you know, that you kind of are not welcome as an immigrant is not easy. Ton of adversity is there. But I think equally, these were probably some of the best times in my life because I look back and think about the lessons, exactly as you said. And for me, that's resilience. It's discipline. It, it gave me this tremendous injection of self-confidence and even more importantly, pride, pride in achieving something, pride in moving forward and, and really never stopping, never really being intimidated by, by some of those adversities. And I you know, suspect that there'll be quite a few more challenges coming my way. Um, I hope so, because I ultimately think that that's how we, how we learn. I think how we embrace the challenges and adversities, how we um, learn to treat those perhaps as uh, more of an opportunity to grow um, is, is, is an art, is an art that we as leaders, again, technologies, you know, learn to, to um, deal with over time. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes, which um, I mentioned before as well, is probably Churchill's never let a good crisis go, go to waste, right? In, all the kind of meaning of, of, of that, you know, on a personal level, it's those challenging times that provide us with the biggest learning opportunity. On a professional level, again, we always look at those, you know, challenging times to look at those lessons learned and improve processes, improve, you know, tools, right? Impro improve how, how we deal with certain situations. So um, for me, you know, it's never looking back and thinking, oh, wow, you know, that that that's... Um, not been something that I would wish on someone else or not, not something nice. It's, it's more around what have I learned and how we move forward. So I'm, I'm actually quite blessed to, to, to have been faced with those um, adversities to be where I am today. I love that perception. Uh, being blessed with the opportunities and the challenges and adversity is a unique way to look at it. You know, we, we recorded an episode with Kirk and we talked a lot about imposter syndrome. Mm. And it sounds like you've turned kind of that, that risk of, oh, I don't belong here into a no, I'm going to find things that I'm going to overcome and be proud of that and learn and keep pushing. So that's so cool to hear just how that shaped you. Um, what are, With that kind of leads me to the, the next question that I have for you, Patricia. You've been, you know, through teaching, you were a French teacher, then you, you know, you got your master's and then you kind of fell into tech as you called it. As you've seen your journey in tech, what are some of those pivotal moments or opportunities that really you leaned into, right? That you said yes to when maybe it seemed uncomfortable at the time that ultimately helped you grow and advance in just your tech journey and your leadership journey to who you are today. What are some of those moments that you could talk about for us? 
Oh, I can I can think about a fair few. Uh, well, absolutely. Listen, when I think about these these moments, um, again, they didn't just help me grow as a leader, as a, as a technologist, but um, also I think they taught me how to take risk. So let me give you an example. Whether it's the risk of pivoting from teaching to IT, from linguistics, right, to, to tech, whether it's um, being a services agent and then becoming a supervisor and then becoming a people manager and then taking on the leadership of a whole service line. It could be service desk or, or field services or anything else. And then taking leadership of a full region and then taking leadership of a global organization. Um, you know, all of those moments, I think, were um, pivotal in, in, in a sense that um, they, of course, were constituting, you know, an opportunity, but also there was a risk. And that risk was having no guarantee that it will work, that it will be a success. And I think it does require some, some gut, right, some, some grit, some, some conviction in, in your abilities. Um, is it sometimes scary and challenging? Of course. Is it rewarding? Absolutely. So, you know, I again, I think similarly to, to what we said before, it's about saying yes to opportunities, about looking at those pivotal moments as opportunity to learn, to grow, but also feel comfortable with the uncomfortable. And for me, the biggest um, challenge in all of that was really accepting that risk. Because, you know, I tend to be a little bit of a perfectionist. I always want to kind of predict the outcome. Sometimes you can't. So that was probably the biggest learning for me. Accept the risk. And you know what? Maybe try and have a little bit of fun in a process, right? We spend so much time at work. I always say this. We spend more time in, in our professional careers than we do with our loved ones and our families. You might as well have fun in, in what you're doing. So just enjoy the ride. That's good. I think. You know, when you talk about having those opportunities and accepting that risk, what does that look like? Walk me through that, like tangibly. Like, what what does that self talk look like? Like, what are you doing? You know, I don't know if there's been opportunities you said no to, right? I, I'm not sure fully 100 percent of your journey, but how do you navigate that when maybe you're not sure if it's a risk you're willing to take or want to take or you know, how do you like, what would you tell someone who's not sure if they're ready for a next step, or maybe they have something that's been put in front of them as an opportunity. And they're like, kind of on that fence, there might not be a wrong answer. But walk me through how you really balance the risk reward, the say yes, do I not? So I imagine there are bad opportunities or bad, <laughs> you know, choices you can make. So I'm just curious to hear you kind of pull out a little bit around that specific topic? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a great question, and particularly um, for, uh, you know, females in, in, in this in industry, and probably not, not just in tech, but overall in, in, in sort of professional environment, we tend to be, um, I think, you know, more, more perfectionist than our male counterparts. And what I mean by that, you know, it, it's that um, often you see this analogy when we apply for, for jobs or put our names in, in a hat, so to speak, for potential opportunities. And I think like my female counterpart, I will look at the job description, I will look at the project or an opportunity and say, well, can I do 99.9% .9 of this? And only then I'll say, okay, right? I, I can do this probably with my eyes closed. Um, so that means I'm ready for it. And actually, for me, probably, gosh, you know, we're talking maybe less than five years ago, it was this aha moment, which essentially meant, hey, enough with the comfort. And that's why I said earlier, you know, starting to feel comfortable with, with that uncomfortable, because ultimately that's how we maximize the learning. And at that point, you know, I started looking at opportunities um, through that prism of, well, if I can grasp about 50%, right, and notice I'm not saying 30 or 20, which I think many of, again, my male colleagues would, but if I can get around at 50, that means I can do half of that and half of that will be learning, maybe a little bit of improvisation, who knows. Um, but it was that kind of, you know, sort of self-analysis, self-talk to say, hey, so what's the worst that can happen? If I can do about half of that and I have a good leader, a good, good mentor, you know, someone there to support me, good, good peer group, right? 
let's take the opportunity. Why not? But again, you know, it didn't come until a little bit later in my career where actually I realized that, yeah, nothing bad is about to happen. And very often, based on my own experiences, taking that risk was just so rewarding. Um, you know, I I was listening to someone else's podcast, actually, with Stephen Bartlett, um, and one of my favorites, and he was interviewing someone who was saying that we should try and feel um, scared or uncomfortable at least once a day. So maybe do like a big presentation to the CEO or something that gets our juices flowing because ultimately that adrenaline creates, you know, that that kind of power in us to say, hey, if I can face this, I can definitely move that mountain. Um, you know, again, it's probably easy for me to say all of this from from this chair of kind of being in the tech industry for, gosh, ne nearly 25 years. Um, and like I said, it, it, it wasn't necessarily something that um, was in my mindset straight away. But it was literally, you know, having that pros and cons, what's the worst that can happen, who can support me, um, and then just giving it a go. I have this image in my head of, and this is going to be a weird analogy, but I think it's worth sharing. <laughs> of, <laughs> there's a video that went viral on all the different short platforms. It was like a two-minute video, um, and it was of this this guy who was running in Colorado, and this mountain lion was in front of him and when you're running and you enter counter mountain line you never turn your back right you never turn your back and so it's literally two minutes of him backing up and backing up and screaming at this mountain lion screaming at this mountain lion so he doesn't get attacked and as i hear you talking about the risk and just you know analyzing the opportunity i i imagine like it's similar to someone who encounters a mountain lion either you have an option either you keep facing the challenge or you get paralyzed in fear or turn and run away, which both ultimately leave you devoured on the ground without, <laughs> you know, escaping that challenge. Um, and so I just picture that in my, in, in my head. And I think it's such a, a good lesson to learn is to make sure we're not paralyzed by fear, but embracing the uncomfortable Right. And, and making sure we're in a place like if you're uncomfortable, you're probably <laughs> you're probably not in the right place. Or if you're comfortable for too long, you're probably not in the right place. So I think it's good. Now, you mentioned okay. I have to check the video out, by the way. You might be you, I'll have to now. find it. Well, <laughs> it's crazy. There's actually a, a whole like you can find commentary on like, oh, this guy did exactly what you're supposed to do. Like never turn your back on a mountain lion. Uh, bad stuff. You mentioned uh, mentorship. And mm -hmm. having people around you and, you know, specifically in women tech and me as a leader who um, has females who reported to me, right? I am their direct boss and, and on my team. I'd be curious to hear from you, number one, kind of how mentors, male and female alike, have impacted you and what can I do? Can other leaders do, be it male or female, specifically me as a male? Um, I'm curious to hear how I can mentor and support the the women in my organization who are trying to grow right who are looking for those opportunities looking for that next uncomfortable moment like what can i do practically tangibly to help foster that i love that question particularly the practical and, and tangible aspect of it so well i i actually today um uh in my current role have an opportunity and a pleasure to to lead our women in tech cohort for the emea region and um for me, leading this group uh, is one, obviously, an amazing opportunity to give back um, and pass those valuable lessons we were ch just chatting about, um, which is, of course, tremendously rewarding. So it, it gives you this, this immense em energy back. But secondly, and, and, and most you know, importantly, is, as you said, is to provide these women and, and the participants of these EMEA sessions with tangible tools, tangible tips, and let's call them techniques um, that they can add to their, what I call, professional toolbox. Um, so let me, let me give you an example. Um, we run lean in like sessions and um, one of my favorite sessions is actually the one around the art of dropping the ball. Um, and it's a simple concept. It's about looking what you're doing today, looking what you're doing really well, and something that doesn't necessarily require your skill sets to be performed. So 
of course, straight away, a great opportunity to uh, be delegated, right? And and really working with clever tactics and clever sort of prioritization lists to then declutter, declutter and find time to, whether it's a few minutes or, or a few hours, to obscure yourself, to do something more strategic, to do, you know, the stuff you never have the time to do because we're so busy. So whether it's a, you know, a session on dropping the ball, whether it's a session on, um power of communication, or um, I run the latest session on power of personal branding. Um, these events are all based on, on learnings and tangible outputs, which really have a purpose of getting women, in this case, together to network, share their challenges, their experience, um, to feel included, but also is that addition of new tools in their professional career growth tool set that they can use in that super uncomfortable, stressful meeting when they're presenting to a senior leader or, or a C-level exec. Um, so I, I, I love these sessions because of that, you know, very tangible focus on this. But I think that that's kind of answer number one. Answer number two, you asked about um, mentors and um, let's call them, you know, maybe also sponsors uh, in, in, in my career. And um, I've, I've been blessed with having super super inspiring mentors throughout you know various roles I performed but one of the things I would say here is that it was never these mentors coming to me to say hey how can I help you you know let me mentor you um, and I think the first most important thing we can do as, as, as aspiring leaders is to approach someone we admire we respect we are inspired by and say, hey, would you find half an hour every every couple of weeks? I'd love to hear your thoughts about X, Y, and Z. You'd be so surprised how, um, you know, how how forward kind of um, thinking and, and, and how keen these leaders are to actually, you know, not only, I guess, transfer those lessons, right, but also support you on the way. And I think that kind of how we also develop the, the high kind of whole concept of sponsorship. So, um, you know, two, two aspects to this. I had some amazing mentors, but I, I have reached out to every single one of them to say, hey, you know, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. Do you think it could help? Never got a no, by the way. So I'd say go, go reach out and you'd be surprised. That's a, uh, I think the response of people, I think you make a really good point, Patricia, is you've never gotten a no. I think it's very telling and and we do, I think are we're battling what I would call an instant gratification uh, world where everything you can order your food instantly, you can get that, that hit of dopamine by watching a funny video instantly, right? Chat GPT is better than Google because you can ask it and get an answer without finding, you know, scrolling to find what you're looking for. You can order on Amazon. I mean, the list goes on and on and on Uber on and on. I mean, in, in the intentionality and desire to grow resulting in you taking the time to go and seek out those people, right? And ask them and say, hey, I want to grow. Can you help me do that? I think speaks to kind of almost a lost art, right? Of how can leaders and women specifically um grow and i think that's such a good practical step and takeaway right for those of you who are listening or watching this later on is take the initiative you know go ask someone to mentor you and i won't go into the details because this episode is not about me but i did that within the first three months of being in tech <laughs> and it was the first time the leader who was actually a woman at the time had ever had that question like hey how can i grow which is, is kind of baffling to me there like, you go you know, and I think your growth, Patricia, speaks to the outcome of how things happen when you're intentional about your own growth. Yeah. You're not waiting for someone to grow you because <laughs> like a plant, those of you who garden know even a succulent only lives so long without some care. So exactly. uh, let Great me- analogy. Let me let me kind of pivot a little bit because we're talking about, you know, a lot about the people side and you're a leader in tech and you have a number of clients, hundreds of clients you work with and you your job as the VP, right, a global VP overseeing multiple 
business units from service desk to endpoint to experience management, which is this new quote unquote buzzword. And, uh, you know, the, the new age of field services where, how does that look different, uh, in your role? Obviously it's really important that you're staying up to date. You know, what's happening in technology. So that being said, what are the things you see trending? What do you think is going to stick? What do you think might not? And, and how do you th- think those advancements, those changes to technology are ultimately going to impact organizations, their teams, and how service desk and tech supports the business outcomes being achieved through those advancement technologies? A lot there for you to unpack. <laughs> I was going to say, how, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> About 30 more minutes if we want it. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, great question. Um, multi-layered question as well. I think we can agree that the last couple of years in the tech industry have really changed the rules, right? So I'm looking at the pandemic, which has forced us to deploy this much faster pace of change. So for example... You know, we have been known to deliver two-year digital transformation programs in two months, right? I mean, unprecedented change in how we used to work. And I think by doing so, by adapting to this unprecedented, you know, technological change, we can't call it anything else, by having this ability to move quickly, we have set the bar high. I think we have excited and, and engaged our clients Um, like never before. So one thing we know, and and one thing is sure in the tech industry is that standing still is simply no longer an option. It it was never an option. But post-COVID, when we shortened the digital transformation from two years to two months, no longer an option. Um, And I keep saying this to my my team, you know, in our industry, um, it literally is evolve or die. And, And I know it sounds really serious. But for me, as a, as a leader of a large team and as a technologist, it's all about that evolution, that continuous learning. It's about being curious about everything that's, you know, in this customer-centric IT service and support world. Um, and I think the most, let's call it a practical lesson we can, we can deploy is, is, is really being creative, right? Being bold, diversifying our experience. I think that's the core thing, diversifying our experiences. You know, it always makes me laugh actually when, when people say, hey, so what's your subject matter expertise? Uh, well, I hope I have many. Today, I'm fascinated by, you know, the experience management. You've mentioned XMO, Experience Management Office, XLAs. Um, I'm super keen to see where we're going to take XLAs next. Um, I really want to see how we look beyond device health into much deeper elements of sentiment analysis, right? And all of that amazing world of experience management. But tomorrow, well, who knows? I really hope to get excited about something else. And I think for me, it's about really that curiosity. It's around developing subject matter expertise in another area because of that, you know, client obsession, because of that passion for that evolution. So, and I think this goes back, Rocky, to, to this concept of saying yes saying yes to all learning opportunities when they present themselves. And if they don't present themselves, it's really going out there and and, and finding those opportunities, you know, whether it's um, focus groups, conferences, right? Fantastic conferences around us. HDI is a great example of that. Team exchanges, you know, good podcasts. Uh, The sources are just unlimited, but it's really around that curiosity. So I don't think, you know, tech is just about tech. For me, tech doesn't really finish the sentence. It's tech plus leadership plus culture. And only then we're really starting to deliver that value, deliver deliver that that so what to our clients and and their end users. So Gen AI. (laughs) No, that's, I think it's good. I was just, just a joke. Now, I think you had a, that's such a good point that it's not just the tech because Gen AI is today, but is it tomorrow? What does it look like tomorrow, right? It's called something different. It has a different you know, way of working. And now, because I'd imagine not uh, the amount of organizations that are truly enabled with Gen AI are very large, right? And I know some organizations with, that you support are working there, are working towards it, right? And um, I'm sure you're ingrained and knee deep in Gen AI conversations tied to knowledge and tied to everything in between, right? But as you talk about culture and leadership, 
I think the question that comes to mind that I think would be good to really talk about and answer is what does that look like from a leader to foster a culture of curiosity that doesn't just say, oh, what call center or contact center platform am I using? Or what's my chat tool or my ITSM tool? But really, it's not about the technology. It's about the curiosity to look at what's next. What does it look like to foster that kind of culture within an organization? Mm, it's, it's a great question again. You know, I, I manage a large organization, thousands of people. And, and whilst I try my hardest to visit every corner of the world, it's it's impossible, right? So um, it, it may surprise you, but I surround myself with good leaders, with people passionate about customer centricity, uh, but most importantly, people passionate about people. People like you, Rocky, <laughs> people who genuinely care, people who can tell a story, people who can get others on, on board, right? Because they have the empathy, because they, they wore the shoes of services agent or field tech and they know what challenges there are. And ultimately, I think these are the people who will drive others to thrive for more. People who can explain the so what, as we call it. Um, why are we doing something? What, why is the outcome of what we do um, important? And, and people who have the ability to communicate and break down the objectives and, and goals into component parts. Um, so I think for me, passionate people who, who are, you know, uh, these client obsessives, hugely, hugely important to really driving that culture of innovation. Um, listen, do we have reward and recognition schemes and programs to drive and stimulate, you know, both great work and innovation? Of course, every organizational does, right? And, and of course, these are important programs there. Um, but I think if I look at, um, you know, even recent exchanges with some of my leaders or, or, or the kind of um, other uh, departments and business units, some of the best ideas, some of the most breakthrough innovation suggestions are born out of inspiration and kind of passion and that client obsession often based on the observation of people you admire. The, the kind of the mentors you cross paths with. And again, we, we, we just talked about the fact that tech alone is, is not enough, right? It, it, it's, you know, really dependent on that human adoption, on, on that leadership, on culture, really required so desperately to, to drive us forward. Um, I don't think we need to be experts in every area of technology. Right? It's simply impossible. Um, but we have to be surrounded by leaders and, and peers who teach us how to think big, how to how to learn, right? How to be curious. So I, I I think you know, gosh, that old saying: behavior breeds behavior, passion breeds passion. Um, you know, my my secret sauce is really surrounding myself with leaders who think like me and and who I know can drive the message forward. And that's a blessing, by the way. And if if you can find them, hold on to them, don't let them go. Um, if you move somewhere, bring them with you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge believer that, you know, um, tech is just, just, just part of the sentence. Like I said, it, it's, it's not everything. It's the culture, it's the leadership, it's, it's the passion of people driving people to achieve an outcome. So let's talk, let's talk about that a little bit. So when you talk about passionate people and to drive an outcome, how do you like, what skills like, because realistically, leaders who are listening to this, like the target audience who's probably listening to this are most likely hiring managers, right? People who are looking to fill their service desk roles or looking for their, you know, their next director to oversee IT and the service desk team and the endpoint team. And realistically, Patricia, like I imagine most of those people listening aren't MSP leaders, right? They're, they're leaders of people maybe we support, right? Or smaller companies or mid-sized companies. How do you navigate what skills to look for? Like when you're hiring a leader, when you're hiring an associate who's going to support your your end user base, right? Your employees, like what are those skills and competencies that really are going to set you up for the future when it comes to people passionate about people? Build on that a little bit. Yeah, no, a fantastic question because I think, and again, listen, this is my view of the world, but I think there is a perhaps a little bit of a misconception out there that it's um it's 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 those technical um accolades right it, it, it it's number of courses I, I see resumes with with just you know a ton of courses and certificates and 
yes, you know, if we're hiring for, I don't know, a very specific technical specialist role, of course, that will be important as a kind of, you know, pre prerequisite, right? That sort of foundational um, basis you're looking for. But from my perspective, you know, uh, and you mentioned, you know, leaders and hiring managers and, and um, our friends in, in the MSB industry, I'm hoping are all looking at the same thing, which ultimately for me comes down to core skills like communication. Um, and, you know, that that's one of the skills I, I don't think I've ever compromised on. For me, that's a must, um, you know, particularly now more than ever we're in this hybrid world we, we're talking on you know a, a, a platform here right we, we're spending half our lives on teams and zoom and you know less so face to face um and because of the fact that we have less of these face-to-face -face interactions and less of that i call it you know a natural oxytocin of a handshake um you know we have to kind of over communicate in some cases um, we just talked about passionate leaders and getting people on board, right? So um, whatever it is that we're driving, whether it's a, a small project or a huge change and transformation program, without that engagement, without that core foundational, you know, good communication, that subsequent adoption engagement will, will be super low, in fact, in existence. So, you know, that's number one. Um, number two, we talked already around um, that beautiful, um, you know, aspect of curiosity um, and that and that continuous mindset um, based on the fact that, you know, tech is going through this unprecedented, you know, change. Right. And, and, and it's not stopping. Um, and, and I think based on that evolution, us as professionals really have to remain curious um, and, you know, that, that curiosity is not easy to test, I think, during a, a sort of an interview process. But I always like to ask questions around, hey, so, you know, when, when you go on LinkedIn or, or, or when, you, when you listen to a podcast, what's actually um, making you kind of stop and, and, and listen? What, what's that thing you're passionate about? What's the latest industry trend? Or, or you know, it could be a, a tool, right? It could be a, a piece of software. What, what, what's kind of tickled your, your imagination a little bit? And it's always interesting how, how people answer it. And then I think you can really tell, you know, the, the kind of skill set there, whether it's, you know, something super technical that's kind of provoked the thought of the kind of so what, so what value will this bring if, if, if you know, we're going to implement it or, or, or you know, deliver it to our clients versus, oh, actually, that's something that can help me transform, you know, how we work. Can it help me transform a department or can it help me uh, lead and manage people in a slightly different way? So I think, you know, it, it's a great question to, to sort of differentiate, you know, that, that um, different, different aspect of curiosity. Um, and I would probably add one more. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's again that, um, gosh, let's call it experience mindset, you know, again, that, that, that client centricity, that kind of um, obsession for going, you know, extra and above. Um, in fact, we had a, a team meeting today um, and, and uh, we were talking about phenomenal, phenomenal service. I, I, I love that, actually. Um, you know that 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 kind of um, uh, use of the word phenomenal, but but I think you're looking at you know someone who will bring a little bit more than your sort of you know traditional approach to how we deliver service, for example, right? So so you know we've we've got you know commercial frameworks and contracts to to keep that kind of you know KPIs SLA aspect, um, but it's but it's it's that you know customer centricity. It's it, it, it's that you know again that that phenomenal um, experience, right? Mindset um, that, from my perspective, is, is super super key, and that links probably to that centricity um, and and that curiosity and also the communication. So, um, you know, I, I, again, all of all of the leaders were looking for different things, but I think um, for me, it's less on the tech side and more about you know how tech enables us and as humans to realize those objectives and, and sort of you know goals um, and how it enables us to to ultimately deliver the service to our clients and their end users so much there <laughs> a lot of <laughs> a lot of good points a lot of good points i think what i heard you ultimately say is that those skills are um when you're looking for to fill those roles right it's making sure 
well, number one, it sounds like you know what you want, right? You know what you need for your organization. And that's ultimately going to be determined by your vision, right? Uh, for your organization or what's it like you can't ever get to a destination if you don't know where that destination is, right? And you need to know what's the gas that I need. Is it diesel or is it is it electric? Is it, you know, how am I going to get there? Um, what's the route I'm going to take? What roadblocks am I going to hit? But all that to being being said, it, people are the center of every organization and people who are looking and care and have empathy for people and ultimately technology that's not serving people. It isn't, I mean, it's not really valuable, right? It's kind of a waste if it's not adding, um, you know, efficiency or uh, for an organization or driving those business outcomes, then, you know, what are you doing? Having people ask those questions, you know, and be passionate about that one thing um, and maybe multiple things for me, it's always going to be people. I know selfishly, I, tech is fun, <laughs> but if I were, <laughs> if I were to be someone who, right, needed to know everything about tech, I would not be, <laughs> would not be successful. Um, so let me ask you, I, I have two more questions for you. Um, the first one, as I hear you talking about, right, the people side and the business side and making sure that people are passionate about technology and kind of how it's driving business outcome, what is the difference between output and outcome? Like when you say outcome, what do you mean, right? What does that actually mean? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think we talked a little bit, um, you know, in the context of, uh, the new focus and experience management, for example, right? And, and and the fact that the XLAs have now dominated the world of um, service and support. Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'm saying dominated. I know some some other organizations might be at the beginning of that XLA journey. Um, but um, that's an interesting um, area where I think we're starting to move away from the traditional way in which we define outcome to ultimately the, the business value which, which which that outcome will, will drive. So let me give you an example. Um, traditionally, we would look at key performance indicators, right? Service level agreements, which will um, look at some important aspects. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should, you know, throw these away and, and, and replace everything with experience level agreements. But I think, you know, these will be, let's say, indicators, which hopefully will, will demonstrate that the service is, you know, doing what it's supposed to be doing, heading in the right direction. There is no gotchas, there's no sort of red areas. But I think when we look at the world of experience management, particularly XLAs, for me, it's about the business value that we can deliver to our clients. And for example, translating um, reduction in downtime of devices to hours saved, right? Hours which are prevented from contacting the service desk or looking through self-help or even talking to a chatbot um, and these hours being used on what matters. So what matters to the business? You know, in our industry and, and, and in our organization, we've got a beautiful set of clients from all industries and all environments. Some of them are in healthcare. Some of them are in finance. You know, if I look at our healthcare clients, nothing gives me great pleasure and, and um, you know, a, a great opportunity to talk about the value of XLAs and going into a meeting with a client to say, hey, we've given you, you know, 2,000 hours back in the last six months that can be actually used to care for patients, to save lives that are not spent on, on you know, dealing with IT inefficiencies. So for me, you know, that's a brilliant example of something that's actually um, transformed the industry to really look at you know, the, the ultimate outcome here, right? The, the What matters, what actually matters on a, on a human level? Why, why is it so important? So uh, for me, that, that's a, it's a great example of moving from, you know, average speed of answer of 30 seconds to, hey, I gave you 2,000 hours back so you can save lives. I love that. I love that. We could talk about, I'm sure, experience, XLA's experience management all over. Before I ask you, like, for all over, what does that even mean? For hours. <laughs> Before I ask you my final send off question that I ask everybody, Patricia, uh, is there anything else you want to share that's happening in tech? Any you know advice for you know women who are looking to grow in the tech space and the tech leadership roles? Before I ask you final question, anything else you want to add? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I, I uh, fell into tech. 
uh, I'm, I'm a linguist, mate, technologist, um, um, you know, gosh, an, an immigrant, right? And and had an interesting journey. And and I think if if I can do it, then I think anyone can. Um, so so that's a kind of key words of encouragement for me to to say that you know we we have a real advantage of living in this period of of unprecedented change and what that means you know that unprecedented technological progress which we really haven't had before and and i think to some extent we can be playful with this right and 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 sort of less scared we talked about risk and reward already um but i think you know it, it's it's um really really a great time and, and a great opportunity to just try different things and again we talked about curiosity a lot today we talked about taking risks talk about you know feeling feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable but i think if there's anything this you know technological progress has given us is probably the opportunity to actually you know again take more risks be more playful um to some extent you know gosh like i said at the beginning of, of the conversation play with chat gpt if, you, if you're scared of doing it in the work context um just just go and cheat a little bit on kids homework you know just just play with it just be be curious be interested because i think that ultimately will help to 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 really you know get into into those um deeper kind of questions around hey what's the next opportunity for me hey am i brave enough to step in the shoes of becoming a cto one day or a cio who knows right um so i'd say listen if if, if i can do it anyone can gbt go play with it get curious ask it anything exactly. you want <laughs> cool <laughs> well patricia the I'm going to ask you one final question, and this is a question I like to ask all of our guests before we send Ooh. them off. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit rewind for you, and let's say we're we're talking to I don't know, let's say 22 year old Patricia. Oof. You don't think about where you're at in life, about things you've learned at that point, what you're going to learn now. Uh, what advice or encouragement or what would you say to 22 year old Patricia if you could hit pause see her face to face and tell her anything what would it be do you know what I I'm a little bit jealous of the 22 year old Patricia because she was a party girl um <laughs> she had a lot of fun in that final year of master's actually degree <laughs> um there was a lot of hard work but there was also good times travel and, and and like I said you know good 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 partying so um you know um nice to look back and, and reminisce but great question there what would I say I would say um you know what don't don't wait um and we talked about taking you know risk and, and and grabbing opportunities when they present themselves i think the the only thing that perhaps i didn't have the courage to do is progress things faster it it, it, it was kind of you know still a little bit of hesitancy in me at, at that point in time to sort of see well you know there are so many avenues, right? You're just about to finish university, you know, graduate in, in modern languages and then, you know, things start to open up and, and you know, you might have done a couple of customer service jobs or, or, or be exposed to, to, to maybe some uh, career opportunities. But, you know, ultimately, I think it's about having the courage, again, having the courage to, to, to just go for it. And I think if I look back, you know, um, and maybe this is going back to that kind of having great time partying, you know, that was maybe a little bit of a, you know, sort of a nice little distraction, right, on the side b before facing these bigger decisions and maybe taking a little bit longer to kind of, um, you know, sort of make a decision as, as for where to go next. And I'll give you the analogy of this in later stages as well. Um, I stayed with one organization for nine years. Um, and if I look back now, I think, well, why, why did I stay with them for nine years? Um, at some point to progress further into kind of SVP role, I would really literally have to wait for someone to move on or, you know, which, which those movements were, were close to none, um, you know, not, not happening. And actually, if I look back, I'm thinking, you know, was it feeling comfortable? You know, was it was it just not really having the guts to say, hey, yes, this is comfortable, this is great, right? A great role, great team, but but what's next? So if I look back at those at those kind of times, I'd say, you know, yeah, 
just, just, just make those decisions faster because I think you get to a certain age and certain point where you think, wow, I wish I tried more. Wow, I wish I kind of progressed these things faster because at this stage I would have X, Y, and Z experiences, right? And and maybe it's just me, you know, super kind of, you know, um, passionate about moving forward and, and really quickly deciding what's for me, what's not for me. Um, and that's where I'm heading with this, you know, that, that I think as a, as a sort of um, young professional, young person, you know, it, it, it's easy to kind of like, yeah, I'm not sure and sort of, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe um, uh, d- delay some of the important decisions. But I would just say, hey, Patricia, go for it. Have fun. Again, what's the worst that can happen, right? Um, who knows? You might have fun in the process, learn something, and, and ultimately decide what it is that you love. And get to something you're really passionate about much sooner. I think that's ultimately you know, the message here. Um, I love where I am today. I love, I love what I do. I, I think I've got a ton of learning in my current role. Um, of course, I don't. I'm not saying you know this is something I, I want to do forever. I, you know, within sort of next two, three, four years, I want to uh, taste hopefully something bigger and better. But it, but it's really getting faster to that point of, okay, I'm I'm passionate about about this. I'm still learning, right? I'm 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 still enjoying what I do, and most importantly, I'm bringing you know fantastic team and fantastic people on board with me. I love that, uh, Patricia. I have heard you talk a lot about growth, about women intentionally owning your growth, not being afraid. I think that that's been and something you've echoed and every answer you've given is curiosity. Be curious and be eager and um, don't don't hesitate to, you know, take that step. You know, don't don't wait. <laughs> Do it. Now is a good time. Right. There's no better time than now. So well, I appreciate you giving us the time to come talk to us and tell your story. And, you know, we could talk for hours. Uh, obviously, we can't do that every day or in every episode. And so we'll have to have you back to talk more about some additional stuff, some other other things in tech and, and more about your story. And when you do, you know, a couple of years, you know, selfishly, I'm hoping, you know, in 10 years <laughs> to take that next step that we get a talk about uh kind of what that is and what that looked like for you and you know and how you prepared yourself for that too so very very much appreciate you being on no an absolute privilege thank you for having me and and rocky just to clarify in 10 years it will be pina coladas on the beach (laughs) so i need to do it much sooner (laughs) no but listen joking aside it's been an absolute pleasure and and a privilege like i said i I love i love the podcast i love uh, the big names and big guests so um felt a little bit under pressure to start with but thank you for putting me at ease and and for great questions thank you so much Thank you. And those of you who are listening or watching, appreciate you joining us. Follow us on LinkedIn, hit the subscribe and like button on this video, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Bites and Banter. 